Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam, and welcome to Stony Creek Church. Service is just about to begin. In fact, this is a great time to make your way into the auditorium as we prepare for our worship experience. After some time singing praise to God, Pastor Randy will continue our message series entitled Royal Flush, looking at the life of King Solomon. Then we will close out our service with one more song and an offering. If you're new with us today, we don't want you to worry about that offering. That is the time for our regular attendees to give to the ministry here. We would, however, love to get to know you better. One of the best ways to take your next step is to simply fill out that connection card in your program. After service, bring it to the Welcome Center in the entryway, and we have a gift for you with some info on the church, a great mug, and even some chocolate. Also, if you are newer to the church, we have an opportunity for you coming today, right after today's service. We call this our newbie lunch. This free Jets pizza lunch is perfect for the whole family and a great opportunity to meet some of the staff and ministry leaders at the church. Please be our guest and stick around. Maybe you've been attending Stony for some time and want to take your next step. We have just the opportunity for you to move toward commitment and learn about church membership. Our four-week Exploring the Creek class starts this Wednesday, March 6th, during our 7 p.m. Connection Night. This class will help you get to know Stony better and give you all the information you need to make the choice to commit to Stony Creek Church. You can indicate your interests on your connection card or sign up at my.stonycreek.church today. Simply click classes and follow the steps to sign up online. One last thing, big things are coming for Stony Creek Church. March 24th is a huge day for us as we host our grand opening and begin our new two-service schedule. Starting that Sunday, we will have two identical services at 10 and 11.30 a.m. Our current teaching time will shift to Wednesdays during our Family Connection Night. We will have invite cards for you next week so you can tell everyone you know. Also, look for promos on Facebook and share those posts. I'm honored to be part of Stony with you as we continue to make more and better followers of Jesus. Now, would you stand up as we prepare our hearts to sing praises to our God? Jesus, 
our banner high. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus from age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus from age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Man, what a great truth that is this morning. We are serving the only king forever here today. What a great honor it is to come, to be here, to sing praises together as a church. You know, we're going to continue to do that right here. And this next song talks about the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name. What a wonderful name. What a powerful name the name of Jesus is. And I hope that you really believe that this morning, that this isn't just a song that you're here to sing because, hey, we're up on stage and we're gathered here together, so let's sing a song. But that you really understand and believe that we serve the powerful name of Jesus that has done so much for us that we did not deserve. So let's continue to sing together and lift praises to that name. You were the word in the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. 
God, we thank you this morning. We thank you that we can be here today, that we can sing those words out. God, that we know and we trust in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. God, we thank you for what you have done in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And we thank you for what you're doing here in this church. God, that's what we want to do today. We want to honor you. We want to glorify you. And I pray that you open our hearts to what you need us to hear today, that we can continue to honor you by hearing your word and taking it out of this place with us, not just walking out and forgetting everything but the main idea, God. But God, that we would walk out different than we came in today. Change us, break us today, God. We thank you that we have that opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat.
Hello, and good morning. Welcome to Stony Creek Church. Glad you could be with us here today. Please uh, get your program and open up uh, and discover the outline in there so you can follow along with this morning's message. Cohabitation. A couple living together without being married. It's extremely common these days. Dictionary.com defines cohabit as to live together in an intimate relationship. Now maybe you're worried that I'm going to spend my sermon bashing unmarried cohabiting couples, but that's not what this is about. In fact, believe it or not, today I'm urging you to cohabit. Yes, I am urging you. I want you to cohabit. Not to live together with someone to whom you're not married because that is not God's will. I need to be clear about that before I get fired. The cohabitation I'm talking about today is the good kind. Living together with God in an intimate relationship. Living together with God in an intimate relationship. That's where this is going this morning. Today is part four in our series on the life of Solomon called Royal Flush. King Solomon had been dealt the best hand that a king had ever gotten. God had chosen his father, King David, to lead Israel. He had uh, promised David an everlasting dynasty that would eventuate in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, his uh, descendant. In our last study, God told Solomon to ask for anything, anything you want. Just ask and I'll give it to you. And Solomon said that uh, he wanted wisdom, wisdom to lead the kingdom well. And because he asked for wisdom, God not only granted his request, but he uh, threw in riches and fame as a bonus. And today we're learning about Solomon's greatest achievement, his construction of the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. How many of you have heard of Solomon's temple before? Put your hand up. Oh, yes. Many, many, many of you have. It was one of the most amazing structures ever built. Not because of its size. Actually, it wasn't very big. Let me give you the dimensions of Solomon's temple. It was 90 feet long. That's only the distance from home plate to first base. That's how long it was. It was only 30 feet wide. That's, not, that, that's the distance of a first down, folks, 10 yards. It was only four and a half, uh, 45 feet uh, high, which means about four stories or so. It wasn't its size, but its beauty and its lavishness. Solomon's temple may have been the most expensive building, certainly per square foot, ever constructed. Solomon used 4,060 tons, tons of gold on the temple. Now, I figured it out. At the price of gold last Wednesday, when I had my calculator out, that comes to $172 billion 241,440,000 dollars just in gold. That's more than Tom Phipps spent on his GT. <laughs> See him out there right now, I'll hear about it later. <laughs> the entire interior of the temple was covered with gold. The whole thing, four stories of walls all covered in gold. The ceiling was covered with gold. The floor, for crying out loud, 
was covered with gold. Solomon used 38,387 tons of silver. By today's price, that comes out to 19 billion. 580 million 440,960 dollars just on the silver. And how about the labor? Well, this was a massive project. Solomon employed 70,000 carriers, 80,000 stone cutters, and about 3,300 foremen. Now, at six days a week, which what they would have been doing, uh, let's say minimum wage here in Michigan, nine twenty-five an hour, and it took uh, seven and a half years to build the temple. That comes to twenty-six billion, three hundred and sixty million, five hundred and nine thousand five hundred dollars in our, in today's money on labor. Altogether, just the cost of the gold, the silver, and the labor, and this is not counting the other precious materials that were used, the cedar that had to be imported, the ivory, all the precious uh, gems and so forth, and the bronze. They, they gave up counting on, on the bronze because there was just so much of it. So this price doesn't include any of those things. The sticker price comes to... Two hundred and eighteen billion four hundred and fifty two million nine hundred and ninety thousand four hundred and sixty dollars. Now you think we spent a lot on our renovation, huh? This puts it in uh, perspective a little bit here. Now compare this price tag to the most expensive building on earth today which is the Abra al-Bayt in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, a poultry, $15 billion. I'm sure it's a very beautiful place. It, it ought to be for that price. But it's a shack. It is a doghouse. It is an outhouse compared to Solomon's temple. Today's message is entitled Royal House. Royal House. Why would Solomon spend so much money on this temple? And why would God be behind it? God was in on this. God wanted this. God had helped David store up the money so he could, the, the gold and so forth for this temple. Why? Why? Why not use it on something else? And what does it have to do with us cohabiting with God? Well, today we're learning about why cohabitation with God is so special and how to experience it. It's all wrapped up in our main idea. The one thing you should remember, if you forget everything else I say, if you're taking notes on your outline, and I hope you are, you'll want to write it down. It goes like this. Cohabitation with God is worth any price. Can't put a price on it cohabitation with God. We're uh, using as our background material here, our source material, 1 Kings chapters 5 through 7. And we're looking at three lessons from Solomon's temple. And if you're taking notes, the first lesson from Solomon's temple, number one, is God wants to live with us. Someone says, he or she wants to live with you, that, that's saying a lot. It's uh, saying that being with you is more desirable than being with anybody else. But throughout human history, it has been God's constant, unrelenting desire and determined effort to live with his people over and over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. He says this. It all began back in the Garden of Eden, a special place that God set apart on earth where he could live with humans happily ever after. God would appear to Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden, probably in human form, and walk with them and talk with them in this, the, the beautiful surroundings of 
this garden. This paradise was our first home. And God's dwelling place on earth, the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden shows us the chief purpose of your existence, and that is fellowship with God. That is your chief purpose in life. That's why God created you. Do you sense a longing to know God? Do you have a hunger for God? Do you? If you do, you want to know him, you want to see him, you want to be with him. If that's so, it's because you were created for that purpose. That's why you have that. But there was a problem. There was a barrier. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. It broke the barrier. Humans became unholy. That spells trouble because God is infinitely holy, infinitely good and pure. And this made God's presence scary and even lethal because dangerous to be around an infinitely holy being when you are unholy, when you are impure. And so God had to kick us out of the house. Cohabitation became impossible. Have you ever wished that God would leave you alone? Hmm? Have you? You can be honest about it. A lot of people will say this. I just wish God would, you know, bug off. Kind of like the police car who's in behind you, you know. Can he bother somebody else? Mind his own business? Have you ever wished God would leave you alone? Well, if you have, this is natural. This is a natural thing. It's not a good thing, but it's a natural thing. You were born with that because God is just too holy and good and there's something about that. We don't want to be around a goody-goody, you know? God is the ultimate. He's the infinite goody-goody. <laughs> really and truly. His holiness and goodness makes us uncomfortable. But despite our desire for him to butt out, God still wants to cohabit with us. In fact, God wants to live with us a lot more than we want to live with him. But there's a major obstacle to overcome. Back in 1991, I was diagnosed with Graves' disease. You know what that is? I, that means that you have an overactive thyroid gland. That's what I had, and it caused me to have just too much, too much energy. Uh, and to cure me, they, they zapped my thyroid with radioactive iodine. And for a, a week or so, whatever it was, uh, I had to isolate myself. I couldn't use the same silverware as the rest of the family or uh, use the same uh, bathroom. I had to sleep in a, a separate bedroom. I was glowing in the dark. Not really. But they, they said I could be dangerous. Too much radiation. They said, uh, I said, is this dangerous for me? They said, no. Just don't be around anybody. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, this is how God is to us, only a hundred trillion times more intense in our sinful condition, his infinite holiness and goodness and justice. It would incinerate us. And yet, despite this obstacle, God is determined to make it work. Long after the Garden of Eden, God settled on Mount Sinai, spoke with Moses and the Israelites. They had to go through this, read it in Exodus 19 and 20, they had to go through this elaborate purification process in order to prepare themselves to meet with God. And when God finally came down on Mount Sinai to speak the Ten Commandments out loud to the whole nation of Israel gathered at the foot of the mountain, there was a, a, a booming display of fire and thick clouds and an earthquake, so much that the people were scared out of their wits. You ever heard somebody say, well, I just wish God would appear. Well, here's where he did to everybody and actually spoke. And the people, they, they said, they, they went to Moses and they said, this is just too traumatic. This is 
way too scary. Just have him talk to you. We can't take this. Have him talk to you, and then you come and tell us what he said. Well, God was still determined. He said, hmm, if they won't come up to me on the mountain, I'm going to come down to them. And so he ordered that Moses build a tabernacle right in the middle of the camp of the Israelites, right at the foot of Mount Sinai, at least initially. And the tabernacle was constructed as a, a portable house of God. You might say it was uh, his RV, you know. He'd travel around in this thing, and they'd assemble it and disassemble it and so forth. And it, it, yes, it, it was dangerous. It was dangerous having God there in the middle. But he determined to live among his people. This is why he created us. Inside the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden chest covered with gold on which sat the atonement cover flanked by these two cherubim, uh, angelic creatures, where, and that, that was said to be the throne of God, right? Where you see that light, this is where God's active presence was said to dwell. The king of Israel enthroned in the tabernacle in the most holy place. Now, all kinds of sacrifices, elaborate preparations, consecrated priests were required to make it possible so that you know, people could approach God without being destroyed in order to get anywhere near God's presence. Something had to die. Something had to die in order for you to, a human to approach God. Either you, you have to die, or your representative. You could, you could bring a substitute and have that die instead. It was an animal, a goat, a sheep, a bull. Something had to die in order to make atonement, to make it possible to come into God's presence. It, this shows, of course, that you, you can't be anywhere near God in a, in a sinful state. Yet God was determined to do it. He was the one behind us. He wanted it to happen because despite the ginormous obstacle of pollution, he loves us and wants to fellowship with us. Nearly 500 years after the tabernacle was built, God commanded Solomon to build a permanent structure to replace the RV, the tabernacle. It followed the same design, same basic structure, same uh, furniture, only much uh, grander scale, bigger and better. Solomon's temple was now God's earthly home. When you brought your animal to sacrifice right there, Outside the temple, the priest would meet you at the entrance so you could perform your sacrifice, but only the priests could enter the temple itself. The temple contained only two rooms. All the furniture was made of gold, of course. The first room, the, the holy place, was illuminated by these giant menorahs that you see over here. There were ten of them. There were five on one side, five on the other. And then there were giant doors that separated the holy place, this is the holy place, from the most, there, there were these big doors, and they're open here, so you can see inside, there's the Ark of the Covenant. And they separated one room from, from the other, where God was actually present, separating that from even where the consecrated priests normally were. It showed that God is off limits. He's too holy. He's too dangerous to approach. Access is extremely limited. Uh, only the high priest could go into that inner room once a year, timidly with the blood on the Day of Atonement. To make atonement for Israel, that was just once a year. Now, when you read all the detail of the tabernacle and the temple, doesn't it, doesn't it seem tedious and, and boring? You ever tried to read through that? Some of you are nodding. 
Why is this in the Bible? To emphasize cohabitation with God is costly and requires enormous sacrifice, but it's worth it. Despite all the ginormous obstacles, he wants close fellowship. You say, close fellowship? <laughs> you call this close fellowship? Doesn't look too cozy to me. He's hidden away in a room for crying out loud. God is too holy and good for us. Maybe this cohabitation thing isn't going to work. Maybe it can't work. Just a lot of blood and stinky animal guts and thick walls and thick doors separating God from humans. That is close fellowship. Is this the best God can do? Well, let's look at the second lesson from Solomon's temple. God made a better house, a better house. For all its beauty, Solomon's temple had a weakness. For this system to work, Israel had to stay obedient to God. Look at what he, God says to Solomon. We find this in 1 Kings 6 beginning at verse 11. And help me out when we come to the yellow print, if you would, please. The word of the Lord came to Solomon. Quote, God is speaking. As for this temple you are building, if you follow my decrees, observe my laws, and keep all my commands and obey them, help me, I will live among the Israelites and will not abandon my people Israel. Notice the if there. Did you see that? See the if? It's up there. If God wants to cohabit, but if they cheat on him, uh-uh. He says he's going to abandon them. He's going to leave them. Within a few short de decades, Solomon and Israel began to cheat on the Lord. That's right, committing spiritual adultery by worshiping other gods and engaging in all sorts of immorality. Now, of course, God was patient, and he warned them over and over again, sending his prophets and so forth. But gradually, after 400 years of Israel's compulsive cheating, God abandoned his people and the temple. It was destroyed. The people were sent away into exile Captivity in a foreign land, yes, 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 I know the rest of the story. God eventually brought them back to the land, and the temple was rebuilt. But the cheating continued. God determined, with all of this going on, to build a different kind of house, one where he could get close with the people, where there wouldn't be all the rituals, and the messy sacrifices and the thick walls and, and doors between him and the people. But how could he do this? How could he make it safe? How could he make it user-friendly? Answer, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Let's look at John 1. The very first verse says, the word was God. And then down in verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now, notice carefully, the Word here, the, the Word, that's the eternal Son of God. That's who it's talking about. The title, the Word, the Lagos, is a, a title for him. And he became human, as we see in this, in Jesus Christ. Now look carefully. The word, it's just one word in Greek, made his dwelling among us. That word literally, skenao, is the, the Greek word. It means to live in a tent. In other words, when the Son of God visited as Jesus, his flesh was the tent or the tabernacle or the, the temple here on earth. Jesus was called Emmanuel. That means God with us. 
God with us. Temples of stone and gold are no longer needed. They were just models meant to point to the ultimate temple, Jesus himself. But what about the obstacle? What are you going to do about that? That's still there, right? Remember what God said would happen if Israel cheated on him, didn't obey the law? Do you remember? Remember the word that was used? He says, I will abandon my people. It's a strong word. I will abandon them. This would be the consequence of their cheating. And so, to remove the obstacle, God the Son, out of his love, decided to step in as our substitute. Remember you had to have the substitute? Well, he says, I'm going to take that role on myself and suffer the abandonment himself to pay for our sins so that we could be forgiven and have fellowship with God. Remember what he said on the cross? Remember these words in Mark chapter 15, verse 34? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you abandoned me? He was suffering the abandonment in our place, you see. Now, we wonder why Solomon spent so much money on this temple. Was it a waste? No way. See, the author of 1 Kings is showing that cohabitation with God is worth any price, even if it's in an imperfect form. It's, it's worth any price. And yet with all the gold and silver and ivory and cedar wood and jewels and labor cloths, the most costly building ever built served an even greater purpose. And that purpose was to point forward to the costliest payment ever made anywhere, anytime by anyone, and that is Jesus' blood shed for you and me. That's what it's about, folks. The lavish, extravagant temple of Solomon was meant to point to a, a, a much costlier sacrifice of the Son of God who tabernacled, made his tent here among us and gave his life so that we could cohabit with him and him with us. Expensive temple? Huh. Pocket change. Chump change compared to the cross. God gave his Son look at the third lesson from Solomon's temple. God's temple comes inside you. Temple within you. Remember where we started. We started talking about cohabitation with God, living with him in a close relationship. Now, how can that happen? Think of the very best relationship you've ever had with anyone. How enriching that was the very best one and now imagine having that relationship deep personal satisfying relationship that kind of relationship with God only much better that's God's goal for you that's what he wants a relationship like that with us with you this relationship starts when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you repent of your sins and trust in him. Scripture teaches, this is important, it uses this language, the moment you repent and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are said to receive Christ, receive him. John chapter 1, verse 12 uses that language, you receive Jesus. Why does Jesus do this? Why does, why does he come inside? Have you ever wondered this? I mean, couldn't he save us without... God created you to live with him in a close, personal relationship. Look what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This is the risen Jesus. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. Help me. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Notice carefully that 
Jesus, God incarnate, is coming over to your house for dinner. That's what it says. He's knocking at the door. He wants to come in. And why does he want in? Well, notice he, he's not pounding on the door. He's not breaking the door down. He's politely knocking on the door. And he wants in because, the verse says, he wants to share a meal with you. He wants to have dinner with you as friends. Now, to grasp the awesomeness of this, folks, you, you need to understand what eating together meant in that culture, in the ancient Near East. You didn't eat with just anyone. No, only family and friends. Table fellowship was reserved for people you trusted, people you loved, people you liked to hang, around, hang out with. You wanted to be with them. Tables then were close to the floor, about 18 inches up off the floor, and you'd sit around. It was kind of a cozy sort of a, a gathering. On more formal occasions, you would recline on couches. But this was the idea. It was an intimate setting where you could share and connect with family and friends. Like, eh, maybe something the way we think of Thanksgiving. This is what Jesus wants to do with you. He wants to hang with you. To share your thoughts and feelings and your ups and downs. And he, 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 want, he does that because he wants to connect with you. Are you experiencing this in your life? Is it like sitting down together for dinner? You say, well, I, I could use some improvement, me too. Let me give you some uh, ways to cultivate cohabitation with Jesus. First, these are on your outline. Keep his commandments. <clears throat> I said, oh, no, I knew it was going to come down to that. You know, <laughs> you know what Jesus himself says? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And he promises that if we do this with a spirit of love that we will feel his love. We will experience his love. If you love me, keep my commandments. Not out of servility, but out of gratitude. Try it. <laughs> Second, B, listen to him talk. How do you do this? How do you listen to God? You do it by reading his word, the Holy Bible. This is the word of God listening to him when he talks. That's what you do with a friend who comes over for dinner. Make a habit of reading a portion of God's word every day. Read through it. Imagine him sitting across from you, talking, sharing. C, talk to him regularly. He talks to you, you talk back. This is called prayer. And then D or C, uh, no, D, yes, it should be D. Thank him for, <laughs> for spending so much on you. Think of it. Think what he did to do this. I mean, Solomon's temple was just kind of a little itty-bitty little illustration to show what he was going to, he was going to foot the bill so you could do this. Thank him for that. But it gets even better. If you do this and you do it with the right heart, you will experience a deep relationship with Jesus. I know I can speak from experience. I have a long way to go. But it, it is the joy of my heart. It's the greatest thing going on in my life. But it even gets better. Every Christian is a mini temple. But guess what, folks? Collectively, the congregation of, believing, uh, of believers is God's maxi temple. It's not a building of bricks. It's not this building. It's not about the building. It's the people, the people. And guess who the, the person is at the foundation? That is Jesus. And each of us makes up a different part of the building. Maybe you're a hinge or a doorknob or a table. Maybe you're a beam that holds up the ceiling. 
every one of us is important to the temple. Inside each one of us is Jesus, and inside all of us together is Jesus. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? This is why the church assembly is so important to come and connect and commit and to coach. Where have I heard that? with other mini temples. That's what it's about, folks. Here are some ways to help build God's temple. Real quickly, first, connect with other believers. Connect with other believers. This is important to do. Connect with other believers. How can you do this? You can join a small group. Go on our website and see. We've got these small group Bible studies going around. Or... You can come to our newbie lunch today. If you're a newbie, we sure love to have you at our newbie lunch. If you've never been to it, you are invited. It's just right at the other way, uh, side of the hallway there, our newbie lunch. Next, B, commit to Stony Creek Church membership. This means you join the team. Take the Explore class, the Explore Stony Creek class is our membership orientation class that begins this Wednesday evening. If you want to be a part of that, sign up on your connection card and drop it in the offering when it comes by. I'd encourage you to do that. This means you join the team. And then, uh, see, invite someone to church. Uh, how about March 24th? That's our grand opening. March 24th, invite someone, bring somebody. Solomon spent billions on the temple. Jesus spent his life for you. Give of yourself. Cohabitation with God is worth any price. We're going to close our service now. Uh, we're going to have our, well, we've got a couple things here. So don't get up and leave yet. We've got our offering and then a little presentation. So why don't we stand together for prayer? If you need counsel or you would like to become a Christian today, become a Christ follower today, come and speak with one of the pastoral prayer team members. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for spending so much on us. We didn't deserve it. Um, we deserve just to be kicked out of the house and, and stay out. But you want us. You, you, you want to be with us, Lord. And you've gone through great trouble to do that. Lord, I pray for the person here who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't have Jesus living within him. That person would come to Christ today. Lord, as we give you these gifts, I pray it be an act of worship that you would enjoy. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Yeah. 